All right, hello everybody. Welcome to this conversation about firebones. My name is Greg Brownerville. Um, I'm the director of creative writing at SMU and happy to be joined today by my collaborator, Bart Weiss. So Bart, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are. So uh, I am the founded and have run the Dallas Video Festival since 1987. I teach at the University of Texas at Arlington and um, I make films and I do a podcast and uh, yeah, a bunch of things. So several years ago, I started having this experience again and again while I was writing poems. Words are my first love. I love writing poems. But sometimes when I would be working on a poem, I would get to a certain image or maybe uh, a certain kind of a, a narrative scene maybe. And I would think, well, I'm writing a poem, so I'm gonna have to render this in words, but really this would be happier if it were an image or a little video or a piece of music. And it's not that you can't do it in words, but different art forms obviously have different strengths. And so one day it just dawned on me, why not create a platform that would work that way where you're telling one story, but at every point along the way, you just use whichever medium or art form seems to you to be the best suited to rendering that part of the story or expressing whatever it is you have to express at that point. And that was the beginning of this concept uh, that this work Firebones is predicated on, a new platform called The Go Show. And that's how it works. It's many different art forms or mediums combining to tell one story. Bart, would you like to add anything to that? Well, you know, media have been changing forever. You know, there's radio, television, VHS, all these other things. And with them come different ways of experiencing that media. Right now we have just a proliferation of so many different kinds of media and different ways to experience things. And so much of this is transformed to, you know, working on our phones here. Um, so the idea of like integrating audio experiences, which we have a very personal relationship with because we have our, our headphones in and, and the sound design is really good and we build in this, these stories and then video, which calls for like a different the way of looking at images to tell one story in that way was just really compelling and a lot of fun to do. And, you know, it, it was challenging to figure out which things go where and how to do them, but you know, I think what, what it is as a viewing experience is a totally unique and cool thing to do. Yeah, and one thing that I'll add is just that a lot of art forms take something that's already happening and make that the basis for the art form. So we move our bodies all the time, but dancers take bodily movement and, and make that the basis for an art form. People use words all the time. Writers take words and make that the material of, of an art. And we're all who, all of us who have smartphones are having this experience every day of navigating among text and image and video and audio. So that was part of the idea too, of like, let's take this thing we're all doing and make it the basis for an art form. And one more thing that we might say before we get into some examples from the show, Bart, could you talk about how audio kind of solves a problem that filmmakers run into with respect well, sure. to like- and, and one of the things before I get to that is, you know, Greg, you have, been writing poetry for a long time, but you've also been playing music for a long time. And music and poetry kind of work really well together. So you've already sort of been integrating media and that's sort of the way you kind of think about it. But from a, a, a filmmaker's point of view, and I think there was a panel earlier about trying to transition literary work into, into film, is it's hard to get backstory in. You know, all the things that um, help, you know, get a sense of where we are in the story. It's like in screenwriting, you try to really truncate that because you want to be in this moment. But the thing about narrative podcast is it's like you don't have the same expectation in your time. You could be listening to these podcasts while you're walking the dog, while you're working out. And so there's a different way our bodies respond to this. And that having this backstory and the other thing I have to say 
is slowing down a story for beautiful writing. There are so many times when in a film, you just can't slow it down too long to just listen to the beauty of words because we want to move the story forward. And there are so many times in the Firebone experience where you get to sort of hear and pay attention to the playfulness of language, which is really, you know, at the center of what this is about. In, in our time, we often think of poetry as this thing on the page with you know, digital fonts on, on blank, white, or ecru paper. But if you look at the history of poetry, it hasn't always been that way. I mean, the classical Greek idea of music was poetry, music, and dance as one art form. And I was in Guatemala a couple of years ago and looked at some of the illuminated, those amazing illuminated Mayan manuscripts where you have image and word working together. And, and when you think about something on a page, language in its origins what was a, a set of pictures and it still is in, in that sense so when i think of poetry i don't I, i'm always wondering like how does it really want to live like what does it want its habitat to be and so since this is a literary festival i thought what we could do today is look at some uh pieces of content from firebones that specifically give us poetry but in ways we're not accustomed to receiving it because the poetry comes out, it's kind of hiding in the show. Sometimes it's video, sometimes it's still imagery, sometimes it's audio, sometimes it's both still imagery and audio. And so we'll, Bart and I will just kind of take you down through the show, uh, show you a few pieces of this and talk about the characters and the, the plot lines that are in play and then open it up to questions. So I think before we show you anything, um, get out your phone right now, you know, and go to your web browser and uh, go to firebones.org so you can see what the interface looks like. Because the, one of the things that's really strong about the show is this visual interface that we have sort of brings you into the moment to sort of prepare you for that. And even if we show this to you on, on the screen here, it's not gonna look the same as it works on, on your phone. So, so firebones.org, do that now. So this is the landing page when you go to firebones.org on your computer. And it's got a number of the icons here. The visual art is a very important part of this production. Uh, the illustrator, Kyla Rose Parrish, created a unique icon for every single piece of content in the show. So here's the, the home page. We have these magical blue hands bringing us content. It's, uh, if you watch, if you experience the, the entirety of Firebones, you'll you'll see. Yeah, the blue hands are part of the part of the show. So if we go into, let's say chapter three. This chapter is largely about a character named Juman Poi. Juman Poi is the son of grocers, very successful uh, grocers and, and restaurateurs in the Delta. He's Chinese American. And part of his job at his parents' restaurant is to write the fortunes for the fortune cookies. And he mentions this glancingly in a video episode that comes. Um, it's actually one of these early episodes here in chapter three. He just mentions that he writes these preposterous fortunes. He's having a lot of fun, like making mischief just putting these ridiculous fortunes in the fortune cookies. And then after you've heard that, you've seen that video episode, there's this episode called Kooky Cookies, which is showing you some of these cookie fortunes. But I thought of this as a kind of poem. So the sequence was very important to me. And the poem is being delivered to you as a, as a kind of music video. And so anything else we should say to set this up, Bart, or just show the content? Show the content. but but. but just before this, there's this wonderful ESPN man piece, which isn't exactly poetry, but if we have time left over, you must see this. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so that's poem number one we wanted to show. So Greg, why don't we talk about this for, for a moment? Um, so for me, working with images is like everyday life. That's what I do. But for you, like bringing these visually in this way, how was that? How did you sort of struggle with that? I mean, we had a great way of working together, but you imagine these as words and now we see them as pictures. How, do, how did that process work for you? I think I've always been unhappy with the limitations of the, the idea that every poem has to be on this white piece of paper with these mm. prefab fonts. Uh, when I was a little kid, before I learned to write, I created a like a hieroglyphics for myself and would write what I thought of as little poems, but they were just ser series of pictures. So it was it was very natural to me to think about getting the images to dance with the language, so to speak. But, but as 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 a craftsman, it's just like working a whole different way. And that was like a major leap for you. And I think, you know, we did it very successfully, but it's like it's a hard thing to do to sort of embark in visuals like this. Yeah, and I mean, that's part of the collaboration between us that I enjoyed was this exactly, exactly this sort of thing. Bart uh, edited that, that video and I, I loved the edit. And I thought, I thought the kind of strange cuts that you did got at the absurdity of this whole business of writing preposterous fortune cookie fortunes. Yeah. And the, the, the Juman Poi's whole idea of life has a certain absurdism to it. I mean, he so it makes sense that he would be interested in writing this kind of material. Indeed, he 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 lives as though it's still 1995, forever. So since since we saw we just looked at a video, a poem that's sort of hiding in a video or or coming at you via a video, I thought we could look at one that is primarily audio based. And part of what interests me about audio poetry is that I think of the roots of poetry as being auditory, the oral tradition. And I sometimes think that technology in the form of the printing press took that away from us to a large extent. And now technology in the form of digital audio is giving the oral tradition back to us with a burgeoning interest in podcasts and audio poetry and so forth. So what we tried to do with this next piece is give you the audio poem, but also show you the poem as written in the private notebook of the character who wrote the poem. So the character who wrote this poem is named Patty Sue Frommer, And she loves this woman named Amra Bustani, a close friend of hers and maybe a lover, it's unclear in the story. Amra has disappeared and Patty Sue is dealing with, with her loss through the writing of, of poetry. 
anything you want to say about that, Bart, before we? No, I, but it, it's an example of how we're working with sound. And, and it's really important that it's not just somebody reading it, there's sound design all the way through this. And we really tried to make the this immersive. Um, so when you're listening to these things, you should like wear earbuds or headphones because it really makes makes a difference. And you know that the sound is right there. So when we're playing this on the computer, it won't be the experience that we're really sort of going after here, but it's a, and a kind of a, 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 of a simulation. But I yes, think, yeah. people, some people said to me, well, Greg, don't you think that there's something unsatisfying about poetry that's coming at you digitally? Don't you lose the intimacy of tactility of like holding a book? But I think there's something incredibly um, intimate about a human voice in your ear. And so the, the actor here playing Patty Sue Frymeyer is Tina Parker, who did a, a beautiful job. And the sound designer is um, a Dallas recording artist named Spencer Kinney, who did a fantastic job, I think, of, get, of coming up with a sonic atmosphere for these words to live in. So this is in chapter one. And it's called Morning Song with Rattles. Now, what you're going to see is a, a visual of Patty Sue's personal notebook where she wrote the poem. And there's some discrepancy between what she wrote and what she actually reads. So that's, you can imagine there's like an edit going on uh, somewhere between the written poem and the poem that you're hearing, the, the said thing. So here we go. Morning Song with Rattles by Patty Sue Frymeyer. When I see a new mother, a shriveled bundle of baby. I remember you, your face glowing on the dirty church floor. When I see an old woman singing with her white braid swinging, I remember you, your woven hair, home in the dark sticks. It hurts. Hurts to know you will not go old. You teach me how. Whenever I see a worship finger twitching in the spirit, I remember a choir and December fire shut up in my bones. Baby, rattle, breathe, rattle, baby, rattle. Oh. What do I do with you now? Yeah, it's pretty great. I mean, it's a, it's a unique thing. It's, it's, it's not just a poem. It's a, it's words on a piece of paper. But it's it's music, it's sound, it's it's a, like a unique piece of media. And why do we assume that silence must be the sonic atmosphere in which a poem as a sonic event will happen? Like why wouldn't there be other things? Same way with the page. And you can see this restlessness here with respect to the the different capacities of language and image. Uh, Patty Sue is playing around with this idea that a, 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 a hair braid looks sort of like a rattlesnake rattle. And that's that's an image in the poem, but she's playing around with it with the doodling that she's doing in, in the margin. So the, the very restlessness about the different capacities of different art forms or mediums that is underlying this entire project is playing itself out in this um, artifact. And, and Greg, you know, it's this thing we talk about in film, the silent film is never really silent it's always has the sound of the room that you're in, you know, people shuffling around. So when you're reading poetry someplace into a microphone, the, the soundtrack of the room is the soundtrack of this. What happens here is that we're controlling the environment and the texture for which that happens. And, it, and you know, it enhances the rhythm, the texture and the emotion of the moment. And I think that's very powerful. Yeah, I think this is something, you know, when I was growing up in a country church, I understood that the preachers understood that their sermons were not just what they were saying, 
that they wanted an interplay between the crowd and themselves. Mm. And when in the amen corner would be shouting various things out in the middle of the sermon, that's part of the sermon. Yeah. And so, yeah, I like that idea of the, the poem not being so pure and just like ensconced in, you know, pristine silence, or if it's words ensconced in a pristine white page. All right. Bart, you want to say a little bit about the character of GoBody? Well, GoBody, um, to me, GoBody is sort of the, the heart, the soul of, of where the story takes place. So GoBody is the adopted daughter of Amra's, the person who disappears. And uh, after Amra disappears, she takes over this church that she was preaching at and then uh, turns it over to this guy who makes it a kind of a community alternative arts center in a small town. Um, but um, she like is totally mourning for her adopted mother and is struggling with how to proceed onward. But she also has an incredibly great backstory. Um, she came from a small Midwestern town um, and she was a little bit different from everybody. And in that town, like everybody was the same. So her initial name, her name that her mother gave her, her nickname was Nobody until she left for the Delta and she changed her name while on the train to Go Buddy. And she came down to the Delta where everybody is a little odd and unusual and all that sort of made sense. And so we're going to show Train Bow here. Yeah. And Train Bow is, is kind of like this mix. So we saw like a pure poem, words, with sound design um, and we saw a video with words, but this is a um, kind of a music video with a poem inside of it. So it's kind of like taking this language and playing with it in a, in a sort of different kind of way. And it also, aside from the words that you hear go buddy telling the story of her transformation, we see the Delta and, and, and it's really important because all of this takes place in a very specific space that has a very specific look to it. And so that's really important. And I have to say, we were really lucky when we were shooting there, we found this beautiful rainbow. It just happened to show up at the right moment. And um, just to, to clarify one thing, GoBody was deemed crazy, insane by her own family and put in a, a, a part of the local nurse, nursing home called the unit, which was for, for people who were troubled or you know mentally unbalanced in some way. And she hated it there and she knew she didn't belong there. And so she escaped and hopped a train south, not really knowing where she was going. And she winds up in this way, Arkansas, the small Delta town. So Trainboat is about that journey. It was rough going. Don't let me lie. Don't even let me lie. But that first night, that first chugga 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 chugga, I felt something inside, like like if my heart was being tickled. When the train took to rattle, I felt like my body was laughing. Like if my bones was giggling, they were shaking happy. My mind's mind said to me, said zoom, zoom into the great American dark. Me and the stars, we was in beautiful cahoots. Me and the wind, we was French kissing. I thought about old Zacchaeus. He climbed up in the Jupiter tree to catch a glimpse of the lovely Lord. And me, I climbed up in my truck tree to do the very same. And it stole me away from the woods. But now I done stole away with Jesus on the midnight train to somewhere new. And the train was the night. I done crawled down into a grainer through a hole like a giant snake now. It was like a little manger. And I nestled up in there, happy as could be. I was wee like Zacchaeus or the blue baby Christ. And, and Pilgrim, I decided right then, from here on out, my name shall never be nobody. From here on in, my name shall be Go Body. And that's who I am to this day.
So Greg, one of the things to think about in this is there's three different rhythms going on. There's the rhythm of the performance of the voice. There's the rhythm of the words. There's also rhythm in the music. So I guess there's four. And then there's the rhythm in the editing in the film. So, you know, normally when you're writing poetry, it's just the words have that sense of rhythm. But this way we have all these other elements that we're mixing um, together, which I think really sort of makes it much stronger. Yeah, and mimics what can happen sometimes in the writing process. Because sometimes when you're writing something, you happen to be, you know, maybe you're at a coffee shop and there's the clatter of cups in the background or people walking around or music playing you know so it's more like real life in that way and the uh Kristen Keith the actor who played Go Body did such a good job of delivering those words I thought and I like the interplay between Spencer Kinney's sound design and Kristen Keith's uh performance yeah all right so the last thing we want to show you is is the longest but it's it's really like three or four things in one it's this piece that Bart, uh, it's a piece of video that Bart edited called Three Ways of Looking. And it's, it's, it's a, it starts with like a piece of a music video and then you get three different poems. And the three poems show these three ways of thinking about this, this woman who mysteriously disappeared, Amr Bustani. And I, I'm not gonna go into all of the backstory about Amra, but some people think of her as a hero. Some people think of her as a villain. Some people understand that she's human and probably a complex mixture of elements. We're, we're, we're exploring these different views of Amra. Anything else we should say about this, Bart? No, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> there's two ways of thinking about it. There's this sort of ethnographic way of just sort of recording what we're seeing, you know, the world as it plays out in front of us. And then there's, you know, sort of searching for the poetry, the soul of what's there and finding way to sort of represent what we're seeing through the eyes and the way that we, you know, 
do our work through you, through your words, and me through images. Three ways of looking. Part one, the plus. Homeschool us. Teach us again about the plus. You flew your crucifix and drew the sky one light, whole soul. Without you, how to mend our smithereens? Who but you can help this fallen letter I that can't remember how to stand? Tumbled to pond page, this drifting minus sign. Part two, the dragon. She is the jaguar, born a moccasin, first cursed in this world town. Never lost her swim, new legs, new fangs, a scripture pelt, it's time. She climbs the magic tree, between her shoulders, one rosette, the shape of a question mark, rips open and sprouts wings. The poetry peels from her body. Call her cloud crescendo, tornado volcano. She is your sky. She shuts her eyes and pictures her dad, her mom, her childhood. Without that bomb, look up. Do you see? It's the devil dragon. She is made of roaring and fire. Best believe she will kill you back. Part three, the shoe tree. I never knew ghosts left their shoes behind, stuck to pine bark like cicada shells until this tree. The stories write themselves each night, each fight spoon rivering through my mind. What is it that I feel? Some of these twins exude a simple kind of hope that doesn't know it's doomed and therefore maybe isn't. Some shrink at the gravity of their sin, steps taken that could never be taken back away from actual love. Bearded with lichens, old sneaker mouths cry out in ragged silence. Too late, these crumpled boots confess their lack and chase the ruby slippers. Only death could slide them off. No Kansas clicks this time. Easy to say, all pilgrims learn to climb this afterlife of shoes, a pretty myth. But does a single soul move higher? Cracked canvas, laces like a shredded flag of white, begin to feel the earth's big tub. One pair enacts a contradictory pact, pointed up and down simultaneously. 
Long years I've wondered what the future he says. I learned so slow. But now, as a town phrase, I hear it clear. Verily, verily, lost in your dark and every other creature's, angels are ascending and descending. One foot scales the sky, one's too drunk for standing. And if you can't love both, you can't love either. Now, I, it's worth saying that when you're looking at this on your phone with a relatively good internet connection, it's a lot smoother. And streaming this over, over Zoom, it loses a lot of the, the subtlety in the, in, in the motion. Um, as a filmmaker, I have to say that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All this is better. If you, and, and you can access the whole show very easily by simply going to firebones.org, which I'll put in the chat. Yeah, for free. I think we should. I think we should open it up to questions. Um, oh, one other thing I want to say before we get to questions. Um, so, we showed you some of the more of uh, uh, the most poetic pieces. There are sections of this film that have, I wouldn't call them traditional narrative, but narrative sec sections where actors are actually reading lines and things like that. So, so not all of the show is, is like this. It's a mixture of this. We tr just tried to, these were the most, the best examples that sort of put the poetry forward and transition them from the page to something else. So I, I just wanted to sort of get you a sense of that. Yeah, that's a good point. We did that because the literary festival, but a, a lot of Firebones is, it's like watching a movie and, or listening to a podcast. So we're happy to entertain any questions or comments. Y'all have any? I saw somebody put in a comment about uh, being from Arkansas and noticing the uh, the plane. <laughs> Arkansas plays a major role in 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 this, um, particularly that Juman character is very obsessed with um, Arkansas football. Yeah, and all Razorback fans are happy today as the Razorbacks are in the Elite Eight of the NCAA tournament. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Well, feel free if you, um, if you have, you could raise your hand. It's hard for me to see all that. It might be easier in the chat. Um, well, if, if we don't have any questions, how about if we show that Juman piece we were talking about? Oh, we have some questions here. Um, so, Greg, what did you start with when you began writing the project? Yeah, this is a this is a fun question. Thank you for that. Um, well, there was so there was the concept of the Go Show that was kind of separate, but the actual writing happened in a very unusual way. What happened is that I mean, I'm a poet and mostly have written poetry books in my career, so I was writing another poetry book, and I started out writing it, and the poems were were. <laughs> formally strange. I, I don't know what kind of uh, weird kick I was on, but I was just writing a lot of formally um, experimental, as they say, poems. And I realized that the poems were not hanging together as a collection. I mean, it, it, it was all over the place. And it was hard to imagine that these poems were written by the same person, because I mean, they were just in different universes formally. And so I just had an artistic problem to solve, like how am I gonna put this stuff together or should I not put it together, I wondered. And then it dawned on me, well, since it doesn't feel like the work of one poet, why not present it as the work of many poets? And I thought, oh, this will be fun. I'll do a fake anthology where I've written all the poems, but I can write these uh, mischievous uh, head notes, you know, the little introductory sections in an anthology, which would be, which I imagine to be more like short stories um, about the characters that I had invented in my mind who were writing these poems. So I was going to create all these different characters who were behind these experimental poems. And then I thought, well, let me weave the, their, their life stories together in some interesting way. And the more I, the, the deeper I got into that project, the more I wanted it not to be a book only. I wanted it to be something else. And I remembered I had this go show idea that had been kind of 
brewing for a while and I saw a chance to put those together. Now, I will say I'm writing that fake anthology now. So a lot of the characters in Firebones are artists and writers. And so I am going to do that fake anthology and I'm having a ton of fun with it. But that's really where that started. Yeah, and, and also, Greg, you have a, a real interest in people's voices. So creating these characters and the cadence of their voice and the way they use that, I think, you know, really help define the character as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we have another question here from Katie O'Malley. How did you decide what parts of the story would have a poetic angle versus a narrative one, like a more traditional narrative orientation? Well, one thing that happened, and Bart, you have a lot to say about this. Sometimes we, we it, it was pure intuition. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you just kind of knew, you know, you just felt like, oh, this has got to be this way. But sometimes we didn't know. And so we would produce it in various mediums in various styles. We would have a filmic version or a podcast version or a written right. version. We would just do it different ways and say, which one's the most compelling? You know, when you're, when you're, pioneering a new format you don't know what's going to work until you're looking at it and then you know sometimes it's like when we found that tree with the shoes you know that became a thing we, that wasn't really what we intended to shoot it just we found these these elements that sort of helped to shift what we could then sort of produce yeah and i see that um there's a that tim rosendale has a couple of questions two questions Tim, unmute yourself. Okay, uh, hi, uh, hi, Greg. Yeah. Um, so you and I have been intermittently talking about this project for what seems like a lot of years now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I, I got into this session a few minutes too late. So if I'm if I'm retreading something that was already discussed, uh, my apologies. But I have a, I have a, a small question and a larger question for you. <laughs> Small question is, is Go Show derived from Go Tell, as in like the Go Tell crusade, which I would not know about except for it appears in an REM song? And the second bigger question is, uh, I came in as you were talking about uh, or asking why, why is silence the pr appropriate context for, for poetry, right? And of course, there's no law against uh, uh, silence not being the context of it. But I was just wondering if, if you did feel any kind of uh, trade-off or loss um, doing this kind of, of, uh, of project, which, which doesn't leave the silence and the white space that you know, traditionally people reading poetry would, would fill in for themselves, right? And make the connections for themselves, as opposed to pre prescribing the, 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 the mood via music, for example. Mm -hmm. or, the images. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the the first one's easy. I, it didn't have anything to do with Go Tell. It was I just brainstormed a bunch of ideas for what to sh for what to call this thing, and I thought, well, it's going to be primarily experienced on mobile phones, probably, and so it's a show on the go. And so, I, and I thought about people like, as Bart said, walking their dogs or commuting or you know working out, whatever, just going places and. Um, hopefully not too busy that they can't listen and focus, <laughs> uh, you know, listening to the show on the go. So that's how, that's where that came from. And it just kind of had a ring to it. It was easy to say. Some of our other ideas were harder to pronounce, which disqualified them. <laughs> and the thing about silence, yeah, there is a trade-off there. I mean, there's a, there is a reason why people, there's a reason why we have, you know, playing museum walls for visual art, you know, cut out the distractions and let people just see the work. But you know, I've, my, I have three, well, I have two, I have three books of poetry and two of them are in that kind of traditional mode of just here's a white page, here are some words, and I've given many a poetry reading in silence. So I've had plenty of opportunities to work in that, that world. And so it was, it was refreshing for me to imagine the words interacting with other materials. I thought about, um, poetry readings where sometimes there's all they're all there's, you know there're all sorts of noise in the room and sometimes it's a distraction 
but sometimes it's nice. And I know I'm saying this as the poet, when you can hear the crowd a little bit, or there's something going on that, and sometimes there are these kind of serendipitous interactions between the noise and, and what you're saying. And so when you can actually think through that and think, well, what do I want the atmosphere to be here? It's quite fun. And it also solves some problems. Like sometimes when you're doing like narrative lyric poetry, you have to explain a lot of things and you're trying to do it sneakily and kind of slyly so it doesn't seem laborious, but you have to like put some things in place so that when you have that moment of lyric lift, the reader's with you because the, 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 the basics have been established. Well, I think about somebody like Shake, like I love, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong lover of Shakespeare's plays and I love the way the play kind of sets up the narrative and sometimes in some kind of workmanlike prose even. And then all of a sudden here comes the great speech. And the great speech is unburdened of the narrative responsibility to put everything, you know, to get all the ducks in a row. So like with the shoe tree, we had this great video. We just found that thing. We didn't stage that. That was just there in the Delta. So I didn't have to, you know, go to, on one part of the tree, there is this type of shoe and you can imagine, you know, I didn't have to explain all that. I could just sing as it were, you know? So I enjoyed that. It is a trade-off. You're right. But I've had a whole career to do the other thing. So I, I really enjoyed this, th this experience. It's also a matter of control because when you're reading poetry from the, you know, user end point, you control how much you read, when you read, the pace you read, and the, the you know, the audience has control of the experience. Uh, we, we are controlling this to an extent, but how you work with the Go Show, how many episodes you run, what you're doing when you're doing them is up is is still up to you, but but we are with the sound and everything else having a much more controlled experience. And one thing you might have missed, Tim, because um, you were mentioning that you came in just a little bit late, is one of my inspirations was um, was Ill illuminated manuscripts that I saw in Latin America a couple of years ago when I was visiting. I, I enjoyed seeing that interplay of image and text in the illuminated manuscripts. And that was also an inspiration for me. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Anything else before, I, at the end here, I wanna turn it over to um, Sandria Faye Smith, the director of this festival to have her um, have a, say a few words to end the, the entire festival. Okay, we have a question here. Do you recommend this to other poets? And if so, what platform would you suggest to share it? once you create such a collaboration. I do recommend it to other poets. Um, I think that the collaboration is exhilarating. I had so much fun working with filmmakers, sound designers, musicians, actors, and so forth. And I think that it gives poetry kind of a new way to exist in the world and, and make its presence felt. It's a new delivery system in a sense for poetry. You can think of it that way. We struggled over the, the platform because we, we actually created an app. Do uh, you want to say a little bit about this, Bart? The, how, how? <laughs> well, you know, our initial idea was that we, we would more control the user end experience. And so we wanted an app and you would have to sign up. And there was a lot of ways in which we were controlling. It was also very expensive to do. Um, but it turned out that to an app development, we couldn't get the look that we were going for. Everything looked very kind of corporate and just wasn't working well. But using a web-based design for the phone allowed that sort of beautiful sense of context. And the, the thing, it's like the, please try this at home, don't try this at home, is that doing the interface like this was expensive and difficult and um, took an enormous amount of time working with an incredibly talented uh, interface designer um, to, to get this experience right. Lauren um, O'Donnell was the yeah. designer working closely with Kyla Rose Paris, the illustrator, and they did a fantastic job. So, uh, and there are ways to more simply do it, but you want to control the experience and have like this, the whole experience be part of the work. And that takes like learning the kind of skills and building the community of people. Um, so, so there are resources connected to this that are important and building a team. 
And and I guess, you know, I guess that's one of the sort of largest differences. Because Greg, when you write a poem, it's you. And to do this, we had, um, you know, look at the, the credits. There are a long list of people that worked on this project for a very long period of time. So it's, it's, it's a different way of working, but you know, it, it just elevates this to a whole nother level and brings it to a group of people that just don't know very much about poetry and gives them a way in. And another thing I'll say about that is that we like the website because you can just text it to a friend. It's very easy to share. It, it removes barriers to the experience. And the last question here before we turn it over to Sandria, um, how do you amp up the opportunities for the audience to interact with the pieces? Do you ever film and stream pieces of this work live and improv with it? We are thinking a lot right now about a live version of the experience or at least to make parts of the story uh, mm -hmm. live and then you would have more interactivity. And that's some kind of a post pandemic uh, kind of thing to, to, to work out. But we are thinking about that. And I think it would be fun to relinquish the control to some extent in that situation and kind of see what happens and let the element of randomness become part of it. There, there may be something like that coming. We haven't really finalized those plans. It, it has been, a tri you know, with a film, there are ways in which you see a film on a screen. Um, this, because of its nature, is kind of hard to do a public exhibition of, which, you know, but it's more of a singular person, you know, experience in your hand. Um, but um, yeah, we're hoping to do a theatrical piece if we get some grant money. <laughs> and speaking of grant money, I just want to say thank you to SMU. Uh, SMU is extremely supportive of this project. And um, yeah, we just couldn't have done it at this time in this way without that support. So we're very grateful. And also thanks to Sandra and all the good folks that at a Dallas Literary Festival for letting us be a part of this. It was great fun to talk with y'all and interact and have a discussion about this piece, which just launched in February. So it's, it's new to, to us and to everybody. All right, Sandra, over to you. Okay, Greg, I wanna ask you one question and maybe you already answered this. What's next? What's next for the ghost show? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Sandra knows what's next because uh, what's going on? What's going on is there's a character in Firebones named Beale McClellan, and she's a she's an important but not central character in the story. And Sandra and I, along with the Firebones crew, uh, Bart and others, are collaborating right now on a spinoff project that's not a go show, but it's in this family of of productions that that mix different art forms. And we're working on this project called Confederata which is about it, it, we meet Beale and Firebones as an adult, but what we're gonna do is rewind to her childhood in Honduras and show um, what her childhood was like and how she wound up getting to the United States. So that's, that's what's next. Also, I'm thinking of some projects that I've been working on, particularly a documentary, and instead of running it you know, as a, as a normal piece, to uh, to run it as a go show, so I think the 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 format has a lot going for it, and uh, it might be just a new, exciting, different way of you know experiencing media. Thank you guys so much. I can't um, can't wait to see how what what happens, uh, what you all do with this. I before I close out, I want to turn it over to uh, Professor Dara Dixon Carr who's the chair of the English department and let him have a few words of closing before I close. And if we're not in church, but you know, feels like it right now. <laughs> Thank you, Sandria. Yes, I, I just wanted to say, um, first of all, um, thank you to Sandria and to um, all the people who worked on, uh, on, on this festival um, as as we said from the beginning of the festival, the the, the goal for reviving effectively the, the festival was to bring it bring back not only um, the festival in general, but to bring it back to um, to the the many great years that it has had at SMU. And Sandra has accomplished that, along with um, several other people um, in in our department. Um, multiple people who worked on this festival and who gave her support, who um, provided many different resources. And 
um, the full credits of, of for the festival are, are on the website. But you know, in particular, I'd like to recognize um, Richard Hearns, who um, acted as as deputy director of the festival. Also, uh, Catherine um, Deloney, who um, who as as our um, student work study um, did an awful lot of work for for the festival in the last um, couple of months. Um, and just a, a lot of people, colleagues in the department, uh, Greg Brownerville, who gave a lot of input into the, some of the vision for this festival. Um, uh, Katie Condon, who um, you know, also gave a, lot, a great deal of assistance and of course uh, helped us to bring Joy Harjo to the festival. There are too many people to thank um, it, in terms of, of what made this festival what it is. But I want to recognize that of course, the chief architect and the, the, the prime mover of the festival is Sandria Smith. And the, the amount of work that she did in, um, in the last several months is just completely indescribable. And I want to thank her for, for this wonderful festival. I've had a, a really great time, very rich time. Um, um, this has been food for the soul in so many ways. Um, our, our hope of course, is that um, the next year's festival will be um, entirely in person. Um, we, we hope and expect uh, that we will have uh, a festival that will be just as inspiring, just as rich, um, but it, it can only be rich if we have you, our audience members, participating, um, attending, and basically giving your, um, your input into what has made this festival successful. So thank all of you for coming. Thank you for participating in this, this cultural event. Um, and I wish you the best for the coming years. Hey, thank you very much, Dale. And along with uh, Richard and Ka uh, Catherine Delana, Delana, Richard and Catherine, Catherine, I also like to thank uh, Dean uh, DiPiero Di and his uh, the communications and marketing for Dedman College and for the university at Hove. We wouldn't have been able to put this on without their support. And I always, in everything that I do, there isn't anything we could do without you, the audience. And you guys showed up for us for this entire festival from Friday through now. And I appreciate that we couldn't do it without you. The Dallas community, literary community came together and helped organize this festival along with me. And I appreciate that. This is the last event, Greg, Greg Brown Deville ended it for us and so Thank you, Greg. I'm so interested in the Go Show. Uh, it's very nice, but thank you all. And I look forward to next year. Uh, please send any comments or anything to the uh, email address on the website. And I look forward, we'll see you same time next year, but only in person. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Sandra. Congratulations. Thank you. Get some sleep. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Daryl.